Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much to the organizers. And thank you to all of you who are delaying your beer another 15 minutes, Friday evening. I feel honored. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about whether or not there is any evidence that early postconceptional maternal stress levels, to call them something, have any role in the programming of the stress axis in their offspring. As many of you know, the stress axis of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis um, is the axis that regulates the stress response or um, responses to challenges. When this axis gets activated, cortisol, circulating levels of cortisol increase, glucose levels um, also increase, providing energy to respond to the challenge, being it uh, an energetic, psychosocial, or immune challenge. Now, what's very interesting to me, after working with this axis for over 15 years, is the amount of variability between individuals in the phenotype that we find. This is um, an illustration of the cortisol distributions produced by 14 women from a highly homogeneous population, a population of Mayan Aboriginal women who come from the same genetic background, have very similar diets, and very similar physical schedules. And so, why do we see so much variation? If you were listening to um, Joe Alcock um, yesterday, humans have a very complex fitness landscape. And because of that, we probably are very good at adapting to our individual landscape, uh, to our individual uh, context, and therefore there's no single optimal phenotype. Now, whenever you see a lot of phenotypic variation, you know that there's going to be a distribution in the, in, in the, in the um, uh, in the phenotypes, and you also know that it's very likely that the extremes of that distribution will end up in something that the uh, medical community will call a disease. So we always hear about um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis dysregulation, and this regulation is involved in a broad range of unwanted health outcomes. I don't like to talk about disease because nobody has defined it properly, as far as I can tell. But it goes from metabolic syndrome to neuropsychiatric disorders. So understanding the origin of this phenotypic variation is paramount to not only our wonderful theoretical games, but optimizing health and well-being of actual human beings. I'm not the first to notice that. And in the last couple of decades, a lot of people have been looking at HPA ontogeny. Uh, most of the research that has been done in terms of um, changes in HPA activity has been done uh, from the moment a woman knows she's pregnant and is um, uh, recruited to a study. So many adults have been uh, studied, many children have been studied, many fetuses have been studied. But there is one period of human development that has not been properly studied pros prospectively. And that period is this one here. The first few weeks right after conception. Why is that? It's because it's a logistical nightmare, because you have to start following women before they conceive. And if you want to do it properly, collecting biospecimens so that you can uh, look at biomarkers, then you have to start collecting um, some matrix, saliva, urine, blood, hair, whatever, the, your nasty of choice, um, <laughs> frequently. That's the other thing. Because this is, this is a very dynamic system, the HPA. So you really need to collect frequent biospecimens. Now, that's the kind of fine-grained definition that we will need to study HPA programming in a holistic way. And you need to know the conception date. Why? Because 
right after conception, right after fertilization, there is a demethylation that is followed by a uh, remethylation of the whole genome. And the, ske the schedule of remethylation for humans is almost unknown. Uh, but we know that there is a rapid succession of developmental milestones, and therefore, if you don't know the date of conception, you don't know if the exposure is on day two, day three, or day four, or day 16, and therefore you're affecting a different biological system that is being developed at that time. I am in a privileged position because of my interest in uh, the relationship between uh, stress physiology and reproductive physiology in women. I have been following women that didn't sound right. I have been studying <laughs> women from before they conceive. And, well, the other is true too, but not any longer. I'm old and married. So, um, I've been studying, uh, I've been, let me just say, following women from before they conceive, collecting urine, saliva, and all those nasties. And as a result, in my uh, data bank, I have information for 22 women from my surf study who conceived on my watch. <laughs> I know the conception day for their kids plus minus 24 hours. And I have daily, every other day urinary cortisol levels right after conception for the first eight weeks. So, taking advantage of that, I went back to Guatemala 13 years later and these kids, do the calculations, they are 11 years old now, in 2013. And um, so I went back, looked at these kids up, and measured their HPA activity in response to two challenges. One non-experimental challenge, a known activator of the HPA in kids, is the first day of school of the school year, and an experimental one, the trial stress test that consists of a very unfriendly confederate like you sitting in front of me, but instead of nodding and smiling, uh, they just basically either are neutral or do negative cues uh, in front of the kid giving a public speech. And to make the torture a little bit more effective, we add a difficult mathematical task that they have to perform in front of these confederates. So let's just start with what I believe is the first description of longitudinal changes in daily cortisol levels across the periconceptional period. Now, coming to your screen very soon because it's impressing human reproduction. Now, uh, if you start four, days, uh, four weeks before conception and you go all the way to uh, four weeks after conception with day zero here being the day of conception, this is what you see. Um, I put all the data points to see, to, for, to show you how much variation there is. And for this particular talk, we are going to focus on the um, first, uh, on the last, sorry, I was talking about four and four, eight and eight weeks post conception. So we are going to focus on the uh, eight weeks following conception. And I want you to see that this, there is a slight increase in cortisol levels right after conception with a small interruption on week uh, five there. I'm, I just told you that because that's new. Nobody knew that cortisol started to increase right after conception. Um, now let's look at kids. In res the kids' response to the first day of school, uh, three weeks around. So the first day of school is that zero there. And as you can see, in the week before school starts, cortisol levels are lower than um, cortisol levels on these two weeks that follow the onset of the academic year. And also nice is to see how they habituate as time goes by. Now let's look, let's look, come on, oops. Let's look at the first week before they start school in relationship to the weekly cortisol averages for the first weeks, the first eight weeks after they were conceived. Here you have it. 
Uh, I'm sorry it's the table, I know it's late, but it's very difficult to show mixed models in images. Oh my god, I have to rush. Okay. Um, look at this. Gestational week five and gestational week seven are significant predictors of their, what we, will, we could call the baseline cortisol level before school starts. Sex, of course. Oh, notice that the effect is opposite. So if you were to do, if you were to look at this uh, as an average of the eight weeks, you wouldn't see these effects because they, can, they, they have um, different uh, signs. Sex, of course, is going to be a predictor because we know the HPA functions differently in men and women. And then there's an interaction between sex and week five, which is shown in this figure, showing that most of the effect of week five is explained um, by a difference in females. So females have higher cortisol levels in the week before school if mom had higher cortisol levels on week five, uh, uh, gestational week five. Now let's look at uh, after school values. Again, interestingly, uh, week five and week seven appear again with the same opposite signs. Now we add up week, uh, gestational week two. I solved the equation, the polynomial that was the best mo predictive model so that you could see these results in a visual, visual way. And what you can see here is that first, males have higher cortisol levels after the school starts. Um, than females, but there is a lot more variation in females um, by when you break it down by uh, maternal cortisol level, post-conceptional cortisol levels uh, divided by quartiles. Here is, thank you, here is the kid's cortisol response to that stress test. Beautiful response. And here again, week five and week seven again. The other one was a natural challenge. This is an experimental challenge. The other one was first morning urinary cortisol. This is salivary cortisol. The consistency of this result is freaky. I didn't expect that. <laughs> Things don't go as well for me as, to, as with Cynthia Bell. <laughs> so, the results are consistent with the hypothesis that maternal HPA activity post-conception may play a role in the kids' HPA programming. Sex appears to be a modifier of that relationship. But importantly, time of exposure relative to conception is important. So it reinforces my idea that if you want to study HPA programming, you have to do it um, using uh, collecting very uh, frequent biomarkers. So it's critically important to conduct prospective studies identifying specific windows of vulnerability for exposures affecting different biological systems. I want to thank everybody in my lab and the people who put the money to do these studies. And if you have questions, I would love to get it because I have more slides, but I didn't have time to <laughs> send them in. I think we have one time for one question. Hi, so what's going on between gestations week five and seven? Thank you. <laughs> I love you. Oh. Oh, no. Where did they go? Uh, OK, let me tell you. Um, Week two, you have implantation and placentation. Uh, week five, you have the first differentiation of tissues that eventually will give place to the HPA axis. And week seven is the earliest we know that this enzyme 11 beta dehydroxy, uh, yeah, that enzyme that basically converts bioactive cortisol into inactive cortisone in the placenta, protecting the fetus, it starts to be present. Now, we don't know if it's produced earlier. I was talking to Harvey to see if we can, see if we can measure it, because in the literature, the only thing we found is that it is present on week seven, but we don't know if it's present earlier. Anyway, 
the point for me is what's going to pro what's protecting the fetus before the placenta acquires all its functions, right? When it's brining in that mess in the uterus. So I think that there's a lot of room for animal studies because I can't sacrifice my kids. I did that for human subject approval and I didn't get it. <laughs> People are against science. And, um, and a, lot of, a lot of research to be done in humans. And you know, if anybody has design ideas on how to detect things that are specific to those weeks, because then these effects are snowballing. So it's very difficult to decide what happens early. You can collect data early, but things continue going on because you don't sacrifice your offspring in humans. Thank you.